know, our theme this afternoon is reimagining America. And you really have to start when you start talking about America with the idea of capitalism. Because this is the home, the epicenter of global capitalism. It was Calvin Coolidge who said in 1925, the chief business of the American people is business. And there's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about in that statement. Business is a wonderful institution. It may be the greatest idea we human beings have ever had in many ways, as I will try to establish. And we can actually go beyond the way that we have thought about it and practiced it the last couple of hundred years and evolve towards this idea of conscious capitalism, elevating our, the consciousness with which we practice business. The Tatas are one of the global exemplars of that. And you just heard a story that illustrates what happens when a company exists in that mode. In fact, we had our Conscious Capitalism Conference in India in the Crystal Ballroom in that hotel three and a half months after that event. A room in which there was a wedding uh, reception taking place and the terrorists came in and opened fire with uh, machine guns. The hotel reopened in 24 days after that attack that you saw. Okay, this is an extraordinary, and then Rohit has told us a wonderful story about that. What has capitalism done? You know, the, what we define as capitalism really hasn't been around for that long. So if you look at human history, you can go back two millennia, you can go back 10 millennia. Human history has been pretty consistent where the default condition of the human race has been one of abject poverty. 90% or so people of, uh, on this planet have pretty much lived on about a dollar a day or less for most of recorded history. And you can go back as far as we have estimates. All of that only started to change about 250 years ago. And the triggers for that were really two or three things. One was the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, which really started in England around 1750. I think of that as a source of energy, like a hydrogen atom, if you will. And then a few years later, Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. This was sort of the intellectual energy to go along with the technological energy of the Industrial Revolution. And in that same year, 1776, we had the Declaration of Independence here. And this is the oxygen of freedom, coming together with the hydrogen of, of technology and the hydrogen of, uh, of ideas to create a new kind of life for humanity, which then you can see the impact over the succeeding two centuries. It is a story that has absolutely no precedence anywhere in recorded history. Look at what has happened to the average person. I'm not talking about the few at the top. What business has done for the average person, per capita incomes have risen by a dramatic exponential rate ever since. And this is all in real dollars. In some countries, the United States, the estimates are the average person today is 100 times better off than the average person was in the year 1800. Our population has grown from 1 billion in 1820 to 7 billion now. It's been enabled by many of the things technology and capitalism allows for. And our life expectancies have risen from 30 to about 65 on a global basis. So the percentage of people living on less than a dollar a day has fallen from 85% in 1820 or so to about 17% today. And Mohammed Yunus, the founder of the Grameen Bank, has said his dream is, and it's a very achievable dream, one day our grandchildren will have to go to museums to see what abject poverty looks like. That is within our grasp. It can happen. That is our recent track record on this planet. So we start with the premise, business is fundamentally good because it is based on value creation. If you don't create value, you don't survive as a business. That business is ethical by definition because it is based on voluntary exchange. There's no coercive power that most businesses have by and large. When it's based on voluntary exchange, it is almost by definition ethical. That it is noble because it can elevate our existence beyond a subsistence level of living where we can achieve the extraordinary potential that is within all of us. As one writer said, this planet used to be molten lava and today it sings opera. Where does that come from? That is the human journey. But when you're simply surviving, there's no way that you're going to develop those higher abilities. And finally, business is heroic because it lifts people out of poverty. You look at China and India and other places and the story of the last couple of centuries, billions of people have been lifted out of that. This is not governments, this is not NGOs, it is not religious organizations that have done this. Business is that institution. And we have this narrative in society that business is about selfishness and greed and elevating the few at the expense of the many. That is simply not true. And yet, we know that we're living at a time when the level of trust and belief in business, especially big business, 
is almost at an all-time low. I mean, if you look at those numbers, where is that line headed? A terrible direction. It was never that high, but now it's down to below 20%. In fact, in 2009, fewer people trusted big business than trusted the U.S. Congress. That's the first time that has ever happened that the U.S. Congress has not been in that, uh, in that particular position. Now, this really matters. This level of cynicism and distrust is a, is a condition for which we all pay a price because when people are that cynical and distrustful, can they be creative? Can they be innovative? Can they truly serve customers and do extraordinary things that we're capable of? You cannot do that. Gallup's data shows that employee engagement in this country is between 25 and 30%. What does it mean to be engaged? It just means I care a little bit about what I'm doing, which means 75% of people either don't care or they actually despise the companies they work for and the work that they do. How can we ever achieve the extraordinary things that we need to do in those conditions? So the question is, why has this happened? Why this growing divergence? Just as corporations are becoming more powerful, larger, more impactful in the world, they seem to be diverging from society or perceived by, by most people that way. The reality is that the world has changed. The needs and the exigencies of the world have changed. And the complexion of the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of decades. And we human beings have evolved to an extraordinary degree. You've all seen that evolutionary chart. The story does not end when we get up on our two legs. In fact, our, our uh, evolution has accelerated exponentially by orders of magnitude. But most of it has gone inward. And those changes are simply not showing up in the way that most businesses operate. We continue to operate with this industrial era uh, model and way of thinking about how people should be dealt with. Now, I'm going to take you back to a year 1989. I talked about 1776, but this year was almost equally significant in our history in terms of what has changed. So the headline event, the signature event of that year was the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And this marked the end of the defining debate of the 20th century. Now, suddenly, we didn't have this argument between competing ways of organizing. Pretty much everybody knows free markets and free people is the way that human beings are meant to be. And that's what leads to all kinds of positive consequences. Of course, we had this scene in Tiananmen Square just a few months earlier. The craving for freedom, political freedom, that that represented. And of course, that did not have an immediate impact, but it has had a long-term impact. It was also the year of the Exxon Valdez oil spill up in Alaska. And in a way, this marked the rebirth or the emergence of uh, consciousness about the environment on a mass scale, which really hadn't been, uh, had, had been dormant since uh, Silent Spring was published in the 60s. And it was the year when the fatwa was issued against Salman Rushdie by the Ayatollah in Iran. And in a way, religious fundamentalism as a force, which had again been dormant for centuries, re-emerged as a force on the global stage, stepping into the vacuum in a way caused by the end of economic fundamentalism. So that's a lot of change in one year. But another thing also happened that year. You know, we all know about the declining birth rates and increasing life expectancies around the world. So what that has done is it has raised the median age of many, many societies around the world. In the United States, 1989 was the first time when we had more adults over 40 than below. Now, 40 marks the passage into midlife. It also marks a fundamental shift in values. When it becomes more about meaning and purpose and connectedness and legacy and less about me and my material well-being. And when society as a whole shifts into that direction, we, we have something we call the psychological center of gravity, median age plus minus five years. Today, the median age in the US is 44. Right, so that, that 39 to 49, that's what defines the value system. In Western Europe, it's way in the high 40s. In Japan, it's in the early 50s. This is a global phenomenon. Societies have rising median ages, which means that what drives them, what people care about, is fundamentally changing. Another thing that happened that year was done by this person. He did something, invented something that year that changed the world more than any other single invention in the last couple of centuries. And most places in the world that I go, nobody has any idea who this is. Most people here might know. This is Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web also in 1989. Okay? Now, what has that done? It has fundamentally changed the world as we have known it because it has created almost complete information democracy, egalitarianism. The average person today has access to more information instantaneously at their fingertips anytime, any place, for free than the richest billionaire in the world did 20 years ago. That's a fact, okay? It's an extraordinary shift. We also now have a tremendously more connected world. This was referred to earlier in the day. 
We now have more active phone numbers on this planet than we have human beings. There are more than 7 billion phone numbers that work. Okay? And there are now more than 1 billion people on Facebook. So you think about what this has done. It has, it has created sort of a global nervous system where all of us are connected, almost all of us, instantaneously, anytime. With all the information that we have access to, we can share that, we can act upon it, we can mobilize, we can do these flash mobs that are so popular nowadays. Right? None of this existed before. It's an extraordinary change. In 1995, half of the world's population had never made one single phone call in their life. This is a real statistic. Okay? And today, homeless people around the world have this technology. We are becoming more intelligent. There's something called the Flynn Effect, which uh, uh, Steven Pinker, who's speaking next, writes about in his book as well. The Flynn Effect says that IQ is rising at 3 to 4% a decade, and it's been going on for many decades. It says that the average person today is more intelligent than 98% of the people in the world 100 years ago. Think about that. We are rapidly becoming, you know, it says that we have a far greater com ability to comprehend and, and uh, uh, assimilate com complex information than ever before. You can't fool the people anymore, okay? Somebody asked me, does that mean we're all getting smarter? I said, no, it means your kids are smarter than you are. Okay, and that's happening every generation. We're also better educated. A, a century ago, only 9% of Americans completed high school. Today, 40 plus percent go to college. In countries like South Korea, it is 75%. The access to education, higher education, is an extraordinary shift, and the impact is greatest on women. Today, about 60% of college students in this country are women, 70 at the master's level. It used to be about 20%. And the women are getting far higher grades. What that means societally is that every white-collar profession will be dominated by women in years to come. Legal profession, medical profession, education already, public service, and business. 70% of new businesses are being started by women. The only area lagging behind is large corporations. They too will catch up. We talk about a fundamental shift, the feminization of the culture, or more accurately, the rise of feminine values in society. All of society has been run purely on masculine values for millennia. Now we are starting to see the rise of feminine values as becoming, in fact, the lead set of values for many institutions in society, and it's about time. And finally, we're becoming more conscious. Now, what does that mean? It means we're mindful and awake. We see the whole reality. We understand all of the consequences of our actions not just the ones we are narrowly focused on. We have a finer sense of right and wrong. 150 years ago, we had slavery not only in this country, but in most countries around the world. In fact, we've had it forever on this planet. It was seen as a normal condition. Most people, including slaves, saw nothing wrong with that. And today, we can't imagine that. 100 years ago, hardly any women on this planet had the right to vote. 75 years ago, we had colonialism. 50 years ago, we had segregation. 30 years ago, we had child labor and all kinds of environmental degradation. 20 years ago, we had apartheid, etc. That list goes on and on. There are things we are doing today we will look back on and say, wow, how did we tolerate that when it is so obviously wrong? So this is a journey that will continue, rejecting violence. You're going to hear from Steven Pinker next. Extraordinary numbers that most people don't realize. We're living in the most peaceful time in human history. And we're learning to live in harmony with nature. So these are all the changes that are happening. And when so much is changing in such a short period of time, how can we continue business as usual? As Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. Our challenges are new, therefore we must think afresh. And we, nowhere is this more evident than in the world of business. We really need to rethink everything that we do and all of our assumptions about business. So what will it take in the future? Well, first of all, companies will have to ensure that all of those trends I just talked about work in their favor. The fact that people are smarter, the fact that they know everything that's happening, the fact that they can communicate instantaneously, the fact that they're hungry for meaning and purpose, the fact that they're more about caring and nurturing and compassion, right? And the fact that they're more conscious, all of that should be a plus for your business. And by the way, for most businesses, it is not. A smarter customer is not always good for most businesses, right? You can't get away with that anymore. And businesses themselves, as these virtual beings that we've given them in the eyes of the law, they have to be more conscious themselves. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. Whole Foods Market, most of you are probably quite familiar with. It's a good example of a company that exemplifies many of these ideas. When the founders started this company, they said, can you build a business on love and not fear? Kind of a crazy idea in 1978. But they said, you know, most businesses, people hate going to work. We have this chain called, thank God it's Friday. Right? What does that mean? Heart attacks are highest on Monday morning. It goes up by 20%. Our work is killing us. Not only is it not satisfying us, it's killing us. Does it have to be that way? No. If you love what you do and you love the people you work with, 
You may say, thank God it's Monday, or you, you, you will certainly be far more energized and enthusiastic. This company started with a higher purpose, to educate people that what you put into your body makes a difference to your health and to the health of the food system and the health of the planet. And that is more true today than it was even then. The obesity crisis and the diabetes crisis and all of the other public health crises are, are more pronounced today. So that purpose animates them. That's what attracts all the stakeholders to them. You will find a declaration of interdependence on their website, not independence. We're all connected. All the stakeholders are interconnected, interdependent in this complex living organism. Therefore, anything we do has to benefit all. We cannot exploit any stakeholders for the benefit of others. 19 to 1 salary cap, nobody gets paid more than 19 times. The average at most public traded, publicly traded companies is 400 to 1, as high as 500 to 1 in some years. Leaders here are not motivated primarily by money or by power. They're motivated by service to the purpose and to the people and to the planet. That's what they are passionate about. Beyond a certain level, money doesn't get you that much more. 100% right? salary transparency. And by the way, 1,800% returns. None of this comes at the expense of performance. That is an important message. So they represent the tenets of what we now call conscious capitalism, the idea of higher purpose, stakeholder integration, conscious leaders who mentor, motivate, develop, inspire, rather than command and control or use carrots and sticks, and a culture based on love and authenticity and caring and transparency and integrity and, and empowerment. Those are the tenets. And in our research, which uh, Betsy mentioned the book, we looked at a bunch of companies that actually had these characteristics. People described them using these kinds of words. And when we did the financial analysis on these companies, our expectation was because they're paying the people well, they're providing tremendous benefits, their customer service is great, they're investing in the environment, investing in the community, they're paying taxes at a much higher rate, their suppliers are profitable. Where is all this coming from? We said maybe their financial returns are good, but not, you know, not, not out of the ordinary. What we found, in fact, over an extended period of time, 15 years, is that these companies outperform the market by more than 10 to 1. And by the way, it's continued even more dramatically in the recent economic downturn. Because we had 10 years of data, we've added five more years here. In fact, they even also outperformed these companies in a book called Good to Great, which were purely selected on their financial performance. And that list included companies, you know, Philip Morris and many others, who don't really qualify in terms of what we talk about as criteria. The reality is that businesses create but also potentially destroy many kinds of wealth, and we have to understand this. We are accountable and responsible for all of the consequences of our actions as business people, and we have impacts in all these areas, financial but also intellectual, social, cultural, emotional, spiritual, ecological, physical, and a conscious business strives to create positive value in every one of these dimensions for all of their stakeholders. A traditional business is content to try to create money, financial returns for their shareholders. It doesn't work. If you destroy value in these other areas, in today's world, guess what? You don't even have the ability to make money anymore. You can't do it. To conclude, those of us who are alive today have an extraordinary opportunity. We have the opportunity to lead the most meaningful lives that human beings have ever led on this planet. And that's a pretty bold statement. But the fact is our challenges are greater than ever. We have 7 billion of us heading to 9 billion. All kinds of issues with water and food and, uh, and uh, energy and many other things. But so is our consciousness of those challenges and our ability to do something out there. Many of the answers are already out there. There's extraordinary innovation going on around the world. All we have to do is to release the internal potential that's inside every one of us. We use this term human resources. Human beings are not a resource. A resource is a lump of coal. I use it. What happens? It's gone. It burns up. Human beings are a source. A source is like the sun. It continuously generates light and warmth and energy and creativity and inspiration and caring and love. Human beings are capable of all of that in the right setting. We are the most powerful form of renewable energy ever conceived of on this planet. And yet most of us in our work lives simply never access all of that. And that's what conscious capitalism as a movement, as an idea, is all about. Thank you very much.